right, everybody. So today on the podcast, we have Kasim Hansen and Jeffrey Verity Schofield. What's up, guys? Howdy. The men How's in blue going? today. So we are here to talk about why Jeff hates Mike Isretel. Jeff, what's going on, man? <laughs> well, I mean, first of all, actually, I like their content and I've liked it for a long time, and I've probably watched hundreds would be an exaggeration, but I've watched certainly dozens upon dozens of hours of their stuff. I bought their book. And so like it's um it's certainly not hate. I would classify it more as as disappointment and maybe confusion. Um, because I have seen some big changes in their content over the past um year or so. Um, and then maybe just some disagreements, which is pretty normal. And it, it kind of depends on who the content is coming from. You know, if Vshred puts out some trash content, that's barely worth talking about because it's sort right. of expected. At this but point. I mean, Mike Isertel, I, I think it's a little bit more surprising. And so, you know, I've never been one to shy away from calling out things that I think are wrong. I mean, I was a Greg Doucette fan at one point. At one point, he was well respected in the industry and not yeah. that long ago you know three years or so people held him in fairly high regard and so credibility is something that is a little bit hard to gain and quite easy to to throw away and so that's that's uh sort of why i made the video um and it's not the first time i've made a video about them and um might not be the last but yeah if i if i have a disagreement with uh someone's content I'm not afraid to uh, make a video about it. I don't, I don't see anything wrong with that either. Yeah, I think credibility is, is always kind of uh, evolving if for some throughout somebody's either time on YouTube or whatever they're doing. I haven't decided what my uh, sellout arc is going to be yet, so I got to figure out something very pricey to put out on the channel, but soon. So, so uh, oh. yeah, <laughs> um, no, so I saw the video and obviously, you know, I, I've had Mike on channel. I, I like Mike when I've had conversations with him and everything. Um, but it, I would agree that there have been some of these changes. And I think you made a point that I've talked about before where ultimately a lot of like, so for people who, who maybe don't know some background, a lot of this stuff, I, I think it's a technique cyborg. Is that the the term that he uses? Right. And so there have yeah. been these Instagram videos and I think they even have a contest where they're saying like, you know, who has the best technique and it ultimately it ends up being almost a very unnaturally strict form with very light weight, um, generally demonstrated by people with, you know, less than impressive physiques. And it, it is almost like a caricature of what good form is supposed to be taking to such an extreme where it's like, is this even stimulative to, you know, any of what the goals would be? Um, and so that, that's kind of what the base here of, of the discussion is. So um, I don't know, before we get too much into it, Cass, I mean, you're familiar with what we're talking about then with Mike's videos and whatnot. Yeah. And I, you know, and I watched Jeff's, mm -hmm. you know, and I think like four or five other reactions actually before. Yeah. This. So apparently this is a, this is a hot topic. I, am not a part of the team forum Rom forum. So I just want to throw out that I, I don't know all of the context of what the intention behind the, you know, technique cyborg videos is. I've seen a couple exchanges with Mike and other people. And I asked him if he wanted to clarify it because we were just randomly talking before I got on here and he didn't offer anything additional. So I'm just going with what I've seen on Instagram. Yeah, and I, and I thought you'd be an interesting person to get on because I know, for the most part, Jeff's thoughts on form and whatnot. And um, whereas with you, Kasim, you obviously put a ton of time into getting form and exercise selection correct. And But yet, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. I don't think that that necessarily comes with you saying, one, necessarily it's all about complete full range of motion, but two this sort of almost like slow exaggerated tempo i mean maybe i'm wrong but i thought that that's you know you could probably have a different insight than maybe jeff or i would have because i think jeff and i are generally on the same page there yeah i think it's interesting when people are looking at this and saying people are focusing too much on perfect technique when 
by default, then what you're saying is what they're trying to do is the perfect technique where I think a lot of people would be like, actually, they're just trying to perfect what I would say is not the ideal technique in my mind, right? right? You know, you could argue, okay, is full ROM at, at all cost? Is that the, is that the scale for perfect technique? And I would say, well, no. So my philosophy is, is that if you're choosing good exercise selection, then all of a sudden that should reduce all of the technical challenges, opening up more options for faster, slower, or whatnot. Like when, if you're choosing good exercises, you tend to be able to do them without having to have 50 cues and go super slow uh, and things like that. And a lot of times the range of motion is built in there. And I also don't think that simply being more flexible or a smaller individual is a product of technique. And I think that's what, at least what I'm seeing is it's like, oh, it just, maybe are these just the videos of the people with the most mobility because they're flexible and they're small. But to me, those aren't aspects of technique. Technique is how you do the motion, not how much can you flex because you have space at your hip joint and you don't have a lot of muscle in the way, et cetera. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, And just, I mean, as far as the, I guess, almost overarching topic, Jeff, that you had made about, and I think it was Alex Bromley who said, Renaissance periodization that jumped the shark and whatnot. And so um, not to discuss it in this horrible way but it is interesting to see because at the end of the day like we are people who all respond to positive feedback i've discussed this in terms of the type of training people do right where it's like well does this person did this person have this perfect technique to become a bodybuilder or did they respond really well and then they gravitated towards something they were good at well in the same way we could talk about that with career we could talk about that with how you display youtube videos and whatnot and it just is the reality that these sort of clickbaity titles will get more views and you're going to respond to that. I mean, of course, Greg Doucette did that to an extreme degree. We've talked about uh, Greg Gallagher, Kino Body, you know, the different persona he may have on Instagram versus on a podcast. Um, there was another good example that I was thinking of the other day, but I know even Mike has, has said this. Mike had mentioned how he literally consulted with somebody who was basically like some social media expert and said like you know to do this and that thing and then it worked and then it grows so it, it's like i can't necessarily fault it it's just interesting because it, i sometimes i wonder is it even possible to be genuinely authentic and still continue to capture a large audience and i don't know if i could think of many examples of that i mean they're they're here and there but it's it's pretty rare yeah, so one thing that struck me looking through the technique cyborg, all of I went I went through Mike's entire Instagram for the past year and a half or so until mm-hmm. they stopped showing up. Basically, they were amazing at first. At first, they were actually really good technique. Something that if I saw, I'd be like, "Wow, that was a fantastic set." Pushing hard, reasonable weights or slowing down at the end, holding on to the technique, very controlled, yet also aggressive and explosive. All these things that I look for in a set, if I'm either coaching someone or just, you know, being a perv in the gym, et cetera. But I I didn't see that in the past, like, few months that he had posted. They were getting worse, much worse. And some of the recent ones that he posted were ridiculous. Like absolutely absurd to the point that I think deep down he knew it was shit. (laughs) He knew it was shit. And I think he posted it just to get the clicks and the views, et cetera, and the engagement. Because as you said, we respond to incentives. And I think Mike has never been shy about putting out his, you know, yeah, yeah. He's never been shy about putting out his controversial opinions. If they're right, if they're wrong. And so it kind of begins to be a a horse leading the cart kind of situation, or maybe the reverse, right? Mm -hmm. It starts where you believe something, you say it, it gets engagement, the post as well. But then you start thinking, okay, well, what can I post, even if I don't necessarily believe it deep down, to get that engagement, because that is where I'm getting my dopamine fix, or that is what is driving the business, which a lot of people are now relying on because we've hired a bunch of people, et cetera. And so 
a lot of people actually commented on the video, oh, but Mike doesn't actually say people should train like this. And these people thought that I had just picked these clips from the internet. No, they were from Mike's Instagram. Mm -hmm. He posted these, he signed off on these. And so I think it really was sort of selling your soul to the algorithm. And I can think of a few different cases where someone hasn't really clickbaited and they've done very well, like Sam Sulek. I mean, it's really just like chess day number seven and then that's it, you know? Um, and there are a few other examples. Does it help growth? Absolutely. But I also think that you can't do this kind of stuff, especially if it's a very rapid change from your old content and expect no one to notice because it is a little bit suspect. And I think that, yeah, maybe it should be called out because if no one calls it out, it just becomes normalized. Well, now the, the entire internet is just sort of curiosity gaps and clickbait. And ultimately it's the viewer who suffers. Yeah. Did you, did you notice as you were going through those, a, a significant increase in engagement as they started to get, as they started to change? Yeah. Yeah. No, there would be some where I'm, and maybe the, maybe some of them were posted by mistake, right? Like it was, maybe he didn't check them as thoroughly or something, or, or he was like, okay, this guy's small. It's a little bit ridiculous, but like it's full range of motion it's controlling the eccentric. So like it fits the two categories that matter. And so he posted them and the normal people are like, this is ridiculous. What is this? this is not what I expected. And it got, instead of maybe 50 comments, it got 500. And then, I mean, we all know that for social media, 5% of your posts that do the best are growing like half of your audience, right? Those, those last ones that just blast off that is what grows your channel account subscribers followers or whatever so yeah i think he probably just is responding to the incentives of of social media which maybe partly to, the platform is to blame but i think uh at this point he knows what he's doing and i think it should be called out i mean he's not the only one doing it but that doesn't mean it's right well, Kaslam, you've obviously, you know, had a lot of growth on Instagram over the years and uh, two related questions. So, so one is, you know, I, I noticed there are certain people with large discrepancies between YouTube and Instagram. So I just spoke with somebody last week and I think on YouTube, he's probably closing in on 200,000 um, subscribers on there, but then his Instagram, you know, just a couple thousand, I mean, like huge discrepancy there. And then I don't know how long you've been doing the YouTube game, but I would say your Instagram is much more prolific than your YouTube as of now, at least. So you yeah, barely dipped the toe in YouTube. Yeah. So I, I guess one is, uh, you know, the difference in platforms within two, as you've grown and one, have you found that you kind of have to almost bring up anything controversial for engagement? Or do you try to just stick to, hey, this is the education. And if you like it, great. Mm -hmm. Well, I think with YouTube, it seems to be that like thumbnails are extremely important and having almost having that clickbaity thumbnail is huge. And then the other thing is discussing about something that people will argue about in the comments seems to be mm -hmm. very good for YouTube. Whereas with Instagram, because it has a more, we'll say a share friendly thing when people will ha has the save feature and those things drive. If you just provide like information that people like, I'm not dependent on people fighting in the comments for a post to go viral, because if people actually really like a piece of content, they will just share it and I'll get the virality there. And then I think, I think with Instagram, the algorithm actually might be somewhat sensitive to you being ratioed when you don't get a lot of likes and shares, but there's a a whole bunch of bunch of comments mm -hmm. and then also like people people love to hate watch and youtube is all about hey you know keeping people watching so i think a lot of people on youtube will intentionally watch content that they are somewhat disagreeable with and those minutes count like a lot so i think controversial stuff does even better on youtube than it does on Instagram. It's still like anything controversial will still do good on, yeah. on Instagram, but I think proportionately it does a little bit better 
on YouTube. I I, I'm like, not a YouTube expert by any means. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I've, I don't want to say I've had the opposite experience, just a different experience in that I feel like YouTube is a platform where just by nature of having more long form content, you can keep up with it one with doing less frequent uploads like with Instagram. It's just everything. It's like it's such a short attention span and it's like daily posting. Like I just personally I just have no I have the Instagram because I like to engage with people like you guys um, and I'll post like, hey, here's a post or sometimes I'll post a meme. But to be doing it all the time every day is just crazy. But with YouTube, obviously, to create the content takes longer to create like a 10 minute, 20 minute video. Um, but I do find that a lot of channels can grow with pretty legitimate, authentic information. Obviously, you're, you're correct. It's a controversial stuff always grows more, right? You know, like this woman destroyed by this guy or whatever <laughs> nonsense is out there. But um, but I do still find that some a lot of quality channels are out there with longer form content um, with Instagram. It's just I, I mean, I don't know. I, I'd be the last person to ask as far as how to succeed at like blowing up your Instagram. But it just seems like the attention spans are so short. And if you have more than a certain number of words on there or even a, a, a reel that takes more than 10 seconds to get to something relevant to the viewer, it's just like, OK, next, you know. I think that if you like, especially if you look at people that have been doing it for a while, um, you absolutely can grow an audience on YouTube, putting out good content, even just relative consistently. But if you look at kind of people that have grown like real over a really fast period in the last couple of years, I would say the, the vast majority of them are, man, they're, they have the thumbnail game mm -hmm. down and the clickbait title down and the topics are always, they're not necessarily, they don't have to be like huge controversies, but they're definitely things where people will have back and forth opinions of, on, which creates more conversation. And I mean, how many things are there in training where there aren't, you know, two sides to, to something, you know, the most unpopular opinion is the balanced middle of the road approach. So all you got to do is be like high volume or trained to fit like any of those things. And cool. You could have half, half the people agree, half the people disagree. And so those topics do really well. Yeah. So going back to the, the technique cyborgs, then do you find then Kasim that you get lumped in to that category, not specifically technique cyborg, but you know, I, I think people consider you know, the people who focus too much on form or focus a lot on form, and that's one big category, right? So I could see somebody who's maybe a little bit less informed being like, oh, yeah, these guys like Mike Isertel and Kasim Hansen and, you know, like Doug Brignoli and, and all these other, like, they were focusing too much on form generally, when in reality, you might actually be saying very different things about form. Have you found that? Yeah. I think people like to lump people into camps on a variety of things. All of these guys are overcomplicating it, but I think depending on how familiar a person is and what somebody knows, they draw the line in different places. So some people might just see the word technique and then just like anybody that talks about technique, I'm just putting them in that camp. Right. Same thing with the word biomechanics. There's so many places that talk about biomechanics and it's not doesn't resemble what we do at all but just because there's that common word association it's it's there i wouldn't say that we get a ton of overlap with rp just because we've put out enough content where we have different opinions on the full rom thing and and stuff like that and obviously mike and i have had debates on opposite side of arguments and stuff before that it's not huge but i do think the general sentiment of anybody talking about this and they're just being like this, oh, everybody's just overcomplicating that. I do think that spills over to anybody that then wants to have a conversation about technique or yeah. form. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, and, and Jeff, how do you think you've evolved with that over the years? Because I know you've talked on a number of different topics, like, hey, volume, I was doing this thing and I've, I've kind of gravitated. Form-wise, where do you think you've shifted the most in the last year or two, whether it's influenced by the conversation or just your own training. Yeah, so I'm I'm usually influenced partly by stuff that I see online and partly by my experience in the gym. And a lot of people that I see 
sort of exclude one of those. So either they ignore everything on social media and they just go in and kind of just, just listen to their own body. And I think that's viable, but you also miss out on stuff. Or people, and this is sort of the stereotypical like science PubMed ninja warrior guy who they're only reading stuff online, but they don't actually know how to get in touch with their body and feel how they should be moving to get the most out of out of their exercises. And so I make sure to use both because I think you should be using both. And if you're not using both, something is wrong. I would say on some movements, I'm stricter than I used to be. On other movements, I get a little bit looser. I might use momentum. I might use partials. I might go beyond failure in some other way. And it it is sometimes difficult to explain. I mean, if I look back at my content or my technique from, say, three, four, five years ago, almost all of it is different. But it's not all different in the same direction. It's not like everything is stricter. It's not like everything is looser. My lateral raises are a little bit stricter because I used to be using like 65 pounds per hand and just flailing around using mostly traps and, and hips and lower back, right? It wasn't actually doing all that much for the area that I presumably thought I was targeting. You know, in other movements, I am a little bit looser, right? Like on my incline curls, I use a little bit more sort of chest pop to get the dumbbells moving and perhaps through a sticking point, but still controlling the eccentric. When I first started doing the movement, I was like, okay, the elbows have to be locked. They can't move at all. You can only be moving at the, at the hand. You can't move anywhere else. It has to be super strict. But I actually found that I could get more out of the movement by allowing just a little bit of, of momentum. And so I would say across the board, most of my movements have changed. It's just that every movement has changed in a slightly different direction. Uh, yeah. Um, Casa, I mean, where do you, because at least from our previous conversations and some of the demos I've seen you do, there is more or less no momentum or sometimes I call it like a little oomph into the lifts. I mean, everything, at least, and maybe it's just for demonstration purposes, seems very strict. So one in your guidelines and then two in your own training, where do you fall on that? Do you ever say, Hey, you know what with like a row, I am going to put a little bit more oomph into it or not so much. Yeah. So momentum can be a friend or an enemy. It just kind of depends. Right. So I mean, if I'm trying to describe likely the, the you know what jeff's going through is like people tend to find a groove with an exercise depending on okay what what's the overall resistance challenge of this exercise and sometimes it's like okay sometimes it's a sticking point here or there and that actually changes as your strength changes and if you slightly get a little bit more strict or loose and one part of your body, then that changes whether or not you need a little bit more momentum here or there. So there's a quote unquote, like groove component to a lot of exercises, especially like free weight exercises and stuff like that. Like you won't see, we don't post a lot of just, if I just post, like, Hey, here's just a bent over row or whatever, there's a million people posting that. So a lot of the stuff that we do post mm. is what is a little bit more novel because that does better. And it also it provides something new to the conversation rather than, you know, I, you know, I'm not a professional bodybuilder. Nobody wants to just watch me just stand and do just a regular exercise that everybody else is doing, right? There's plenty of better looking physiques that you can watch do this. You know, they're interested in my content for like, hey, here's a different way to add stability or find a different range of motion or to slightly bias a different division. So that they're looking for, for those nuances in there. And I would say the other reason that you might not see like a lot of what may look like momentum is in general like the majority of the training that i do is heavy enough that then the weights just don't move that fast yeah and if like if things are challenging in the length and position which is a lot of the stuff that we're doing like you just can't create that moment you're not at least going to generate momentum without using some some other joints or whatever that aren't necessarily the main participants we'll look at it is if we're going to try and generate momentum with something that isn't the target tissue, if that's solving a like, okay, maybe it's making the resistance profile better, or maybe it's allowing me to eke out a little bit more eccentric or something cool, that's, you know, those are viable strategies. But when that's not the goal, then basically 
I can do as an aggressive contraction I want with whatever I'm targeting, but I shouldn't be trying to move the weight with some other portion of my body. So if I'm doing a row and I'm focusing on my lats or my upper back, like creating movement out of the lengthened position with my hips isn't necessarily helping unless it's intentionally to allow me to maybe manage more load on the eccentric or something like that. So there's not necessarily one technique per exercise because depending on what you really want out of that set or that exercise, maybe you're going a little bit heavier or maybe you're trying to extend a set, et cetera. There's reasons to add or subtract relative to the goal. I know that's probably the boring nuanced answer that nobody wants. And now this video is going to get zero engagement, <laughs> but I'm not like, Hey, it's momentum is good or bad. It's there's a time and a place to use it depending on what you want out of the set. Don't worry about the engagement. The uh, thumbnail is going to be Jeff beating up Mike Israel. So uh, we will have plenty of clicks. Yeah, there we go. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> I'll just be watching from above in one of my Iron Man suits. <laughs> right. Uh, this, this is just more my my curiosity, Kasson. But but how do you actually train? My understanding was I think you had made a reference somewhere about having a very good bench. I don't know if you've there previously or currently. Like, how what's your current training like? Um. Fending off decay is how I like to how I like to describe it. I mean, to be honest, I I like to vary my training like in kind of a block periodization way. So I will go through periods where I'm focusing a little bit heavier, and then I will have phases where I'm doing very dense training. So it's incomplete rest, lighter loads. And I I like having kind of that like variety. I like being able to take breaks from super heavy lifting, but I also like to lift heavy, but Especially as I'm getting older, there's just a certain amount of volume that I can tolerate at really heavy loading, but that doesn't keep me from wanting to go back to that well. I just don't stay there to an unproductive degree. But I mean, most of what I would qualify my training is, is it's very high efficiency. So it's I'm really particular with my exercise selection. So it's very goal oriented, which is, of course, extremely easy with me having the facility that I have. Right. So it's not like I have to use a bunch of inefficient exercises or anything like that. And with that, I can choose a good resistance challenge that I want, meaning if I want to focus on the length and position, I can. If I want to focus on the short position, I can. And so I can be just very, very specific. And with that specificity, I can work relatively hard. And I would say. We get all sorts of athletes, coaches, and stuff in here. I trolled Brian a little bit when he was here last weekend. They were doing this failure test on the on the pull down or whatever, and they got like six reps or whatever. And then I just walked in cold and casually started doing like 20 reps and talking with them or whatnot. So I my physique is not necessarily representative representative of how hard I train because I also because I eat to compensate for. So I would say I train the opposite way of I eat. That's probably the a good way to do it. My training is the opposite of my diet. Yeah. yeah. Um, Did you ever have dedicated powerlifting phases? Or I mean, it seems like you're you're a pretty strong guy. I never really focused on powerlifting. Um, I did focus on certain lifts for football. And then I, you know, despite being a humunculus, really enjoyed strongman. You know, it just sucked that so many events didn't favor having, you know, T-Rex arms, mm -hmm. but, uh, but I enjoyed the process. So I never really got into powerlifting. Um, but you know, I did like West side method for bench and squat for a while. Right. But I didn't do it necessarily for deadlift. Cause you know, my, my squat was always basically better than my deadlift in my younger years because, you know, I, my arms are, you know, six inches long. So <laughs> like, it was a lot easier for me to figure out the squat. Now, you know, I don't really deadlift, but I can still RDL like, you know, a, a lot of load and stuff. Yeah. So what'd you get up uh, to the big three? I'm curious. In terms, I mean, I never did a, a meet where I had to actually meet a total, but, you know, but in terms of gin lifts, the most I've benched, is 465 but that was with a fat bar if that counts for anything yeah we'll still count it so right i mean but should 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 be harder i've squatted close to 700 pounds but i've only pulled like around six oh we so we i know weak, i know yeah deadlift has never been my lift but i also never put probably time and effort into deadlift once i actually became more proficient at training because I pretty much just used RDLs as my primary for that. So ironically, 
I could probably at this point, I could probably get close to RDLing my max deadlift for a mm. triple. That's, <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. No, I was just laughing when you were talking about <laughs> fighting decay, because I, I think I might have said this to Brian too, but just how much time, especially as you get older, just goes towards fighting entropy in life. Like you just like so much of stuff is just maintenance from like brushing your teeth so there's not literal decay to just working out so that you're not getting fatter and slightly just like there's so much like a third of my day is just trying to fight the the woes of time basically yeah and it only it doesn't get easier <laughs> yeah right right um so uh just real quick on the i i know i'm sure you've talked about this in many places but I think with a lot of the conversation lately on length and partials and how that that's probably the best portion of the movement, uh, you said sometimes you might want to actually emphasize the contracted position. Can you give maybe an example of when you might want to do that? Well, for one, when we look at research where they're varying training, that always seems to favor over just using a simple method. And we have several examples where combining lengthened and shortened seems to provide some sort of benefit, whether that's in the Pedrosa study where they were using the partials and the leg extension, or the latest Cassiano study where they used the glute bridge and they added that onto the leg press and RDL. Now there was an additional volume in that group, but like the difference was substantial. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is just strength tends to be there's some specificity to both the motion and the range of motion you're doing. So I think when you're looking at the muscle link thing, if you only have if you only have one egg to put in the basket, you want it to be a lengthened biased exercise. But that doesn't mean that you should only use lengthened biased exercises because there seems to be regional benefits and overall benefits to training the full range of motion. But ironically, Maybe the worst way to do that is trying to do it all at once, but actually it might end up being that, hey, we can actually get a little bit more out of the length and position if we focus on an exercise that's challenging there, and then we can get a little bit more out of the fibers that are more recruited in the short position that when we choose exercises that are more biased towards that. So not that necessarily that full range of motion is bad because basically – Full range of motion training basically just means going through the whole rep, but essentially combining full range of motion with constant tension might end up proving to be the most least efficient way because you get fatigue, of course, the whole rep, which basically limits you from really taking any one portion of the rep to a really big failure point. Whereas with exercises like a dumbbell press, is pretty hard at the bottom and it's pretty light at the top. So you're not likely getting a lot of fatigue from the lockout that's taking away from what you can get out of the lengthened position, right? But if you were to say, do that same exercise and you throw some chains or bands or have a machine where you really have to squeeze the lockout, what that might do is it might cut how many reps you would get relative to if it was just hard at the bottom. So that's, that's where I think we're going to end up that's that's my crystal ball of looking at the research right now is is that yeah if you only have one thing to do length and bias is good but i think that what we're going to see is there's some sort of complementary benefit to challenging both the length and the short position but the most ideal way for hypertrophy might be if we can actually break it up rather than trying to find one exercise that's hard through the whole range of motion that's interesting. Yeah. So, so you think, and would that be exercise dependent? Obviously it would be exercise dependent in terms of where specifically, but do you think almost all exercises will in an ideal world find almost two different positions that you could emphasize? All exercises or all muscle groups? Uh, yeah, I guess all muscle groups would be the way. Yeah, I, I think probably all muscle groups, right? And maybe some way more than others because, you know, for two joint muscles, you just, you really can't get full range of motion for most two joint muscles in one motion anyway, because you have to do some, you know, kind of circus act thing to do it, right? Like you can't do like a full range of motion bicep curl is basically bowling. That's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what it right. is, right? Yeah, interesting. Jeff, what do you think? I mean, have you, I wouldn't say incorporated I, this, but are, are you taking certain exercises 
are you implementing exercises that you feel are really concentrating on the stretch versus the contraction? Um, and are you consciously doing that for each muscle group? Yes. Um, for example, I tend to pair lengthened with shortened curls, right? So I might do a preacher curl plus a spider curl where I'm lying on the bench and it's toughest at the top position. But I think for me, the perspective is more doing a lot of length and focused work together just beats me up too much, hmm. right? Like before I went back to my wife's hometown and I took a week or two weeks off, I uh, actually doubled up on preacher curls and incline dumbbell curls. And it was just too much. Like I was just doing too many sets and it, it just, I think short focused work is generally easier to recover from. And so if you compare set to set, lengthened versus shortened, okay, lengthened is maybe more stimulatory, but also more fatiguing. But if you do shortened fo focus work, maybe you can get away with doing more sets. And so it's not really direct comparison because, I mean, if you're doing a hip thrust and it's shortened focused and it's, it's more of a contraction based movement, I mean, typically I have found that I can do way more of that stuff and it just doesn't beat you up. It's almost therapeutic, right? Like if you have tight hip flexors, or, you know, you have some mobility issue. I found that actually hip thrust, and I got this from Al Kampiri actually, hip thrusts with a really, really focusing on that top position was actually not just ergogenic, but therapeutic as well. And so, yeah, I do think that focusing at least a little bit on that contraction portion of the range of motion it's almost like free volume, right? Because because if anything, maybe you can do some length and focus work one day and then come back a day and a half or two days later or something and do some contraction focus stuff. And it's almost like blood flow because even taking it to failure just doesn't beat you up that much. And I actually feel like it helps recovery more than anything. So hmm. um, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that cast, but that's just my experience where I do try to sort of alternate or pair lengthened and contraction and focus stuff um, just because they do have a very nice synergist synergistic effect and uh, I know Milo is doing lengthened only work and uh, man if I did any kind of volume with that I know you can adapt to it and, and I think he's doing okay but for me uh, I think short focus work is still very valuable yeah, I totally agree that there's a different fatigue component, which with the stretch that the whole calcium ion channel thing, that seems like there's the way I described it is like lengthened bias training is going to give you more chronic fatigue. That's like that inflammatory cascade that comes after yeah. possibly some of what's associated with DOMS, et cetera, where a short like short position training, the, the fatigue is very acute, meaning like it burns and it sucks during the set. Like the, the difference being like, if I do, if, if I do the same exercise and I throw it on like the lengthened challenge, if I use my leg extension, for example, that I can flip the resistance challenge, if I put it on the lengthened thing and I, I go to absolute failure, it's tough, but I get out of that machine and I walk off and I do the next thing, but I'm going to be sore. Like I'm going to be sore. Right. But if I focus on the short position. I may be able to take myself to the point of fatigue that like I almost fall down stepping out of the machine, but in two minutes, I'll be fine. Like I'll be ready yeah. to go again. So it's just such a drastic difference in the type of fatigue and the timeline that you get from it. I wouldn't go as far to say that I think that it's, that it enhances recovery. Yeah. That's probably, that's probably taking it a, a, a little too far, at least in terms of what we can extrapolate, but it's definitely different from a fatigue perspective. And the other thing is, is this with a lot of muscles, the specificity that you can have in the short position is also like, it's just, you can get way more laser focus and specific because if we take convergent muscles like the pecs, for example, when your arms behind you, you're kind of stretching all the pecs to a certain degree and they all help. But once you get into a really short position, what ends up happening is, is that basically the line of pull of the different muscles 
is now much more angular. So like when your arms are crossed, your clavicular fibers are pretty much pulling up and your costal fibers are pretty much pulling down. So the difference in function in the short position is much more varied, whereas in the length of position they share, which makes sense from an evolutionary perspective that like, hey, if our joints being pushed into a stretch range, we want to have a lot of redundancy to be able to come out of that position. But we don't necessarily need to have a whole bunch of redundancy to hold the shortest possible contraction. If anything, it's kind of inefficient for us to be in the shortest possible contract. We're wasting a lot of fuel there. So from a training aspect, you can look at this as like, okay, one of the reasons that lengthened exercises might also be a little bit more fatiguing is they just tend to be working a larger portion of the tissue in general as well, on top of all of the other mechanisms for inflammation and whatnot. So where short position stuff, you might be focusing more on a smaller either number of heads or divisions of a given muscle. So you're just like, you're just taxing less tissue in general, as well as the difference between the acute versus the, the chronic fatigue. Cool stuff, man. Um, yeah. yeah, I was wondering, is there any actual, I mean, I, I think a lot of people would agree anecdotally that the uh, emphasizing the contracted position seems to result in, you know, quicker recovery. Is there any research that you're aware of Cassim, on that specifically on recovery there? I mean, I don't know that there's research showing short positions enhance recovery in any way, but we do have research showing that the what happens during the stretch impacts fatigue and inflammation, right? And to a longer time course, right? right? So basically what we have is we have evidence that the stuff at longer length contributes more to fatigue, but I don't think we have any evidence that like short position has any like counter benefit to it. It just has the absence of those extra fatigue factors of the stretch mediated ion channels and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that... But let's say fast forward five, even 10 years, we get a lot of this research parsed out. Do you think that ultimately you are going to just find that, hey, this is going to get people where they're going to get faster and with less injury? Or do you think that it's going to ever get to a point that we're able to break past barriers that we were not able to, let's say, in like the 90s or early 2000s? Thanks. I, th I think it's more so it's just going to change the time course. I think a lot of what we're finding out in terms of like new ways to be, you know, new ways to make your training a little bit better really impacts the efficiency. Like, cool, I can get ahead of the game. I can get where I was going to get in 10 years in seven or, or whatever it may be. But I think if we're talking about really like pushing the limits are the best of the best going to all of a sudden, is there going to be a new standard set because we've just found out new things in the research? I don't think so. Because I think as we start actually pushing towards whatever the genetic ceiling and stuff in there is, they're just like, I mean, training at long muscle lengths just isn't going to be the thing that pushes you there because you there's so many things that can just start limiting your ability to grow muscle after, after a yeah. certain point, especially in natural lifters, right? So I don't think that we're going to get to a point where we can create endpoint physiques that are massively different. But I think what we can do is, is that we can get people to their mid and better physiques faster with just less time also needed in the gym. So not just that it can happen in fewer years, but also just a, they don't have to spend as much of their life on the grind because they're just simply able to get a little bit more out of the time that they do spend. And if you, I would imagine that if we're being more efficient, that that just decreases the probability of injury. But I wouldn't say that, oh, hey, focusing on lengthened positions is a safer strategy. Really, all that come down, comes down to load management and the technique thing, et cetera. You know, like it, it only takes one rep to get injured. Yeah. So, so, so I, I, I don't think that we're going to get to a point where, we can overcome, hey, you know, somebody got out of position with a heavy load and they weren't controlling it. Well, th that's going to happen regardless of what you're focusing on. But obviously, if we just simply decrease the amount of work that it takes to get somewhere, well, then the probability shifts, right? Like, okay, cool. Maybe 
injuries are reduced a little bit, but not as a, like a direct mechanism per se, just like, Hey, it just will decrease how much you have to do this. Then the probability of you getting injured doing it goes down. Are you telling me, Kasim, that you don't think Ronnie Coleman would have been bigger if you had taught him the right way to implement biomechanics? I mean, what's it's just unfortunate that Ronnie had was just so far away from his potential because if you had a squatted deeper, he would have had bigger quads. If you would have done hip thrust, he would have had bigger glutes. Every everybody has the secret to make Ronnie Coleman better. Except Ronnie Coleman, like man, everybody knew but him. Oh yeah, so no, it's, I've just, got a it's just very unfortunate protocol that would have just blown his up for sure. So. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, I, I I would tend to agree with you um, as far as what this gets us because realistically, it's just not what I've seen. Obviously, drug protocols and whatnot have changed, and I'm not trying to say natural bodybuilding hasn't progressed at all, although. There are people who who do say that. I think even Chris Paraket on the podcast had said that. But um, realistically, I found with people I train and whatnot that I try to get people there as fast as possible. Not necessarily, you know, obviously there are risks to going too fast, but as fast as reasonably possible so that they're not just kind of like just floating along for years. Obviously, you want to minimize injuries because that will set you back dramatically. Um, and, and I think that there are ways that you can find that are either more enjoyable. There, there's a lot of ways to get to that end goal, but this is kind of where the interest changes for somebody in my position where, you know, I'm coming up on 20 years of lifting. And while I find it interesting, if I didn't have the podcast, to be honest, like I, I sometimes wonder what would happen with my own training because I got into the podcast five years ago and that was right when I was kind of done making substantial progress. And I sometimes wonder if I didn't have the podcast and I wasn't so connected with all of you guys and whatnot, would I have just gotten to the point where I was like, you know what, like three days a week, I'm just doing my thing. The research might be interesting, but it's not changing anything for me or somebody in my position. And because I have clients that change stuff for them, but it's just not going to make a difference at this stage. Um, and, and so I can kind of empathize with the people who have been doing this for so long. They're just kind of like, you know, maybe they're not the nihilistic level of Lyle McDonald, <laughs> but they're, they're, they're getting there, you know? You know, yeah, you could look at it as it's, it's unfortunate that we tend to start reaching the wisdom in the gym around the point that like our newbie gains like are starting to diminish yeah. so that we really can't like really test out like hey is like this special is this improvement in my technique really going to make a difference or whatever but you could also argue that once you get to once you get to that point where actually your gains are just going to come at a smaller amount now all of a sudden it's like efficiency is your friend and so i think if you take this knowledge and you apply it to like hey i can start getting like the absolute that I can get is just less. That's just the reality over time. But I can start getting the whatever I can get out of less time and less effort or with the strategy that suits my preference, like understanding that there is flexibility of like, hey, I can do harder sets and fewer of them or I can do more sets and with a little, like I, I have options so I'm not like, stuck to one way where you know when we're younger and we start training yeah everything works but we also feel like we just have to also try and do everything and i think part of what you learn is man i can actually get the most or at least a good portion of what is possible right now with a variety of strategies and if i understand and apply them appropriately right if you want to do very few sets cool there's tons of ways to efficiently train with very low set volume. If you don't like like pushing heavy loads or you don't like pushing crippling close to failure, there there are other options. So I think with the wisdom comes flexibility. And then if you leverage that for efficiency, I think it works. But if you're attached to just the magnitude of gains, well, like that's just 
not going to happen. Sure. You know, with with anything related to biology in general, right? You're you're not going to keep getting faster. You're not going to keep getting stronger. You're not going to keep getting bigger. You, like nobody nobody is like, hey, I just started getting healthier after forty. Like like you know, as much <laughs> as people want to sell you the magic serum or whatever, it's like you know that's that's not how it works. It's just that's just age and that's time, and we just have to be realistic with it. But I think if you look through the mindset of man, now I have all these cool tools where instead of spending 14 hours training like I was when I was a kid and I was doing sports and then going to the gym in the morning or whatever, now in three or four hours a week, I can get what I need to get done and I can do it in a way that I enjoy. Yeah. Yep. Any thoughts on that, Jeff? Yeah. I mean, that's very well said. And and people should realize that hypertrophy is a very forgiving adaptation. So high volume, low volume, Frequency is also fairly adaptable. You can do higher frequency, slightly lower frequency. I mean, I don't recommend once every two weeks or something, but, you know, once per week is at the very least viable, right? I mean, people did bro splits for a very long time and lots of people got big off of them. So your volume, your frequency, loading, again, 5 to 30, maybe even higher than 30, all viable. You could even go under 5 if you're willing to do more sets. Um, exercise selection, again, very, very flexible. I mean, I, I haven't done a pull-up in a while. It's been mostly actually these optimal pull-downs. And I think my audience is going to be a little bit surprised when I come out with a video saying, like, I don't do pull-ups anymore, because I think a lot of them are sort of attached to these basics. And it's okay to have an emotional attachment to an exercise, but knowing that there are other options is also very freeing. It doesn't mean you have to do them right? It's just an option. It's just something you can do. You know, if your elbow gets cranky, pull-ups might be off the table, and but some kind of pull around or some kind of pull down or some kind of more focused target exercise, that might be the way to go. So yeah, I mean, I think as a beginner, everything is going to work, as you said, Cass, and then you kind of have to tease out, okay, what do I like doing? Because that's what you're going to put the effort into. And effort is is kind of a common denominator, right? It's it's always going to be challenging because if it's not challenging, it's probably not doing anything. So, kind of just pick your poison and and pick your favorite flavor, and then off you go to hypertrophy build. Pull ups are the last one I've been holding on to, so I don't do heavy deadlifts or squats anymore. I haven't done a heavy bench in couple of years really um i got into it a little bit after covid again and i just said it's since stopped um and i don't really have any ego with those lifts anymore um you know once upon a time it, it was cool but I, I don't anymore overhead press once i got to about 225 i was like all right like i'm pretty happy with that and i think to go beyond like it starts getting to that point where it's like okay i could put a ton a ton of work into a 235 and then it's just like, it's not probably netting me more muscle. It's probably a neurological adaptation through high frequency and whatnot. So I was like pretty happy with where I got on those. Um, Pull-ups are, are the one that remains. And I don't know how long that will last for the first time I'm getting. It's not even elbow. It's almost more like the bicep tendon, but I'm getting a little bit of, you know, a little bit of issue there. So yes, exactly. Um, yeah, <laughs> you get that from pull-ups? Or just yeah, that's why I haven't done them in a while. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's it's weird though, because I actually I, I think I might make a I, I told you guys how I, I got very sick recently, and I think I might make a video about like it was like the worst possible way you could start a diet. I started and then I just got destroyed for like three or four weeks. So I'll, I'll probably make a whole video on it. But um the one plus side was for the first time in my life, I took two weeks off from lifting. I mean, I've literally never done that, even when I had a major surgery. And uh it, it helped a lot of things feel better, but still not that kind of bicep tendon area. So we'll see. Um, I really love pull-ups. I've been doing them for, I mean, again, almost my entire training career, but go ahead. Yeah. I actually have an interesting comment on that because I mentioned I was combining preacher curls and incline curls before the break when I went back to my wife's hometown. It's the one time a year that I don't lift. And a couple of days after I got back to her hometown, and I didn't really lift the entire time. It was cold and like slush everywhere. I couldn't really get in any ring workouts. 
But a couple of days after not lifting, my elbow starts hurting. And it wasn't like an acute injury. It wasn't like, oh, I, I lifted it and I, it felt bad during the workout. It was like two days later. Hmm. And, you know, a month and a half, two months later, it's still like not quite right. So it, it's one of those things where you think that injuries always happen in the moment or they're chronic and you can feel them building up. But I didn't feel anything when I was lifting at all. It was when I stopped lifting that was the issue. So I, I think the moral of the story is never stop lifting. And you'll be okay. <laughs> yeah. Water, running water, Bruce Lee. Running water is, is the way to go. If you keep well, if you keep going, you can't get hurt. Well, there's definitely something to be said for you know some activity helping with these things uh, for sure. And maybe I just needed. I mean, I wasn't doing any crazy high volume, um, and I've never. I, I, I got a little worried one time because I was going to do weighted pull ups, and I was like, you know what, this just doesn't feel right, and there's no reason to get an ego in this. But I've not. I'm sure I could YouTube it and find it quickly. I've never seen a bicep tear on a pull-up. It's almost always like a preacher curl, you know, supinated arm with a deadlift. Um, yeah. But I still just don't want to risk it. I mean, it's just like, okay, it, what's the point? But um, yeah, I've just, I've always yeah. liked pull-ups in part because I'm, I'm relatively strong with them. And also, while I understand that, like you said, hypertrophy is very forgiving, I still stick to the fact that I, I personally believe that strength is a huge component of that. Like, I mean, whatever exercise you choose, I think you need to be progressing in that over time. And so at some point it's like, man, I'm not doing any of the exercises I was doing for the first 15 years of my training career. And it's like, what's the comparison to, and, and of course, like there's other ways that you could measure and you get DEXA and, and measurements, but I like to have some, foundation there so that when i'm let's say when i'm dieting you know you're feeling a little skinny and you've lost all this weight and you can look and say hey no i have this and the last time i was this lean i was doing this and so i must have a similar amount of muscle whatever versus um just a quick anecdote two back exercises so i just have been developing this home gym and i'm doing i just incorporated a low cable row so like chest supported low cable row row really enjoy it after getting very sick, two weeks off of the gym, I come back and I put like an extra two reps on each of my sets, right? But it was a new exercise. So it means nothing. Meanwhile, yeah. I go to do my pull-ups afterwards and they were, the I mean, worse than I've had in years. I lost four or five reps off my pull-ups because that's an exercise that I've been doing for a very long time. So I know I talk about this on the channel a lot, but that neurological adaptation and getting used to an exercise, there's so much to be said for that. And, you know, full circle with RP, sometimes I think that the frequent changes in exercises can be a problem in that if you're doing that while dieting, I, I almost think of it like it's the, if the body doesn't want to hold on to the muscle and it's like, well, I can either like in this pull up example, I have to maintain my muscle to can to keep that performance but in this new exercise i could still lose muscle and just increase that neurological adaptation to maintain performance yeah it's just some thoughts on it yeah. i'm curious yeah, no, have you have you tried dropping your ego and going super super slow with half the <laughs> weight <laughs> <laughs> on on pull-ups or just in on every, everything on it did absolutely everything, everything. oh on everything <laughs> well i don't i don't ego lift on, on most things um i will say on my i need do more range little, motion what's yeah, that? that that was satire you need more range of motion <laughs> yeah um yeah my pull-ups i will admit i have one set that is uh it is like a little bit it's not even i mean it's a full range of motion it's just a little bit you know a faster tempo but everything else I do these yeah. days is is quite controlled. But maybe I need to uh, become a technique cyborg for sure. Let me let let me play devil's advocate to the the strength thing, yeah, and to. needing to be consistent. So, it, it, the the more you train an exercise, the more neurologically efficient we get it get in an exercise. So our per, our performance relative to our muscle mass is going to improve, right? But and that also then means that. We're working with higher loads. We're putting more forces through the joints and the connective tissue, whatever, to to get that right. 
where is if we're rotating in exercises and maintaining a small degree of novelty, then our absolute performance in a single set is going to go down because we just can't perform. We don't have the neurological efficiency. So our maximum strength in that thing is, is not going to be as much, but when it comes to performance across multiple sets, like once, once you have a couple of weeks into an exercise, there's not as big of a difference. Like an exercise that you're really good at, if you do a hard set, like close to feel, you're going to have a certain amount of drop off, right? In terms of the second set, third set, right? If you're, if you're front loading your effort. So I think a lot of times we look at things through the lens of a single set and that performance. And we forget to look at like the cumulative performance and whether or not there's a significant difference there. And I think this is also where like training to failure versus not training to failure might not be relevant after a certain amount of volume. Cause it's like, yeah, if you're doing two sets and that's all you're doing, man, you, those sets better be to failure or beyond failure to get a lot of stimulus. But once you get to where you're doing four or five, six sets, if you actually looked at the cumulative work that you were able to do would going to failure early and dropping off more versus starting at two RIR and being able to maybe maintain your performance a little bit better. Does it just end up being a wash over that volume? And therefore that's like volume is kind of the thing that just kind of washes away all of the needs to do things one way or another. And so my argument would be is not that there's anything wrong with keeping certain exercises in there and focusing on that, but you may be actually pigeonholing yourself into the position where, man, I have to use higher loads and more joint forces to continue making progress because I'm constantly using exercises that I'm extremely neurologically efficient. Whereas when I'm using things that are a little bit more novel, my absolute peak forces in those exercises are going to be down but as long as I'm getting in the volume, basically that's gonna that's gonna wash out. I don't need to have the best performance in my top set. Like I couldn't press 465 on a barbell bench today. Like not even close. But I can probably dumbbell press as close to, you know, for 90% of what my PR is because that exercise is currently familiar. And I'll go do something else and then then I'll and then I'll come back and I'll be able to start dumbbell presses at smaller absolute loads, but I'll still do the volume and stuff or whatever. And it kind of to me what I notice is as long as I'm doing enough stuff, I don't necessarily have to be PRing at any specific movement. I just need to be getting in quality stimulus across that muscle. And in novel exercises, that just means that. I'm not going to fatigue as much from set to set because it's just not as much of a neurological demand. And so as long as I'm doing some volume, good. Now, if you're stuck in a very, very low volume approach, that might favor the, hey, be consistent and stick with stuff you're efficient. But if you're a little bit more flexible with your volume, then you might argue that, hey, actually moving around my exercises is almost a, we'll say kind of like an orthopedic safety net of like, Hey, I just don't have to use as heavy loads this way because I'm rotating my exercises a little bit more, but as long as I'm getting in the volume, I'm not dependent on maximum strength performance for hypertrophy. So I would agree that orthopedically it's probably beneficial, obviously lower risk of overuse injuries and whatnot. I would wonder though, so in this case, in your example, you know, I would imagine that you would agree that you're not really gaining new muscle at this point in your training career. So you're, you're doing things that are, you know, going to maintain it. And I think maintenance obviously is a lot easier. I could probably never do the same exercises again and just keep doing whatever fun workouts I wanted in the gym. And as long as I'm, you know, doing somewhat sufficient volume and, and intensity, I'll probably be okay. But let's say you were taking somebody who, was trying to gain as much muscle as possible. If you were rotating somewhat frequently and you were never beating those old PRs you had, do you think that you would be gaining substantial amounts of muscle if you're just rotating through, getting a neurological adaptation, rotating and again, more neurological adaptation, et cetera? Yeah, I, I don't think that we have to have a peak performance for like 
the the mechanical tension that we need for hypertrophy is at an individual sarcomere level. So like it it do, it doesn't care what the absolute whole muscle tension is per se, which is if if we needed peak performance within a set, then we wouldn't have the flexibility in rep ranges that we have, right? It would have to be like, no, we have to do all low rep, very, very high intensity work to get, we would see a significant greater benefit in those rep ranges than we would in some of the, the higher rep ranges, right? And I would also would say I'm at, I have not got to the point where I'm gaining zero muscle year over a year, especially like if I actually dial things in for a small period of time. Now I'm not gaining it like I was when I was 22 years old or anything like that. But every time I do actually try and push and prioritize something, I do gain. I have actually recently decided that I think I am going to have to take lat training to maintenance only because I have just enjoyed like playing around with all the different things so much that my lats are now an inconvenience in my life, you know, with like day-to-day -day activities, if you know what I mean, right? Like it's, they're starting to get in the way of things. And, you know, I have various measures that I do or whatever, you know, from DEXA to the, um, to the BIAs and circumferences, et cetera, whatever. Right. So even like, okay, my arm circumference is like slowly going up over time. Right. So, um, so you're at peak muscle mass now is what you're saying out of your whole life. So yeah, pretty close. I would, uh, not everywhere in my body, but in my body as a whole, right? So like I just, this year, I hit 260 at about the same body fat percentage that I was when I was, I think the last time I like really tried to push, I've made it into 245, 246. So oh. like, you know, so that's how much of that is just whatever, but it's not going to be zero muscle by the time, you know, it, 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 it all comes off, right? A certain yeah. amount of that's going to be fluid and glycogen, et cetera. But, you know, cause it's lean body mass, right? I'm not measuring muscle thickness sure. everywhere, but for sure, my lower body has been bigger. Um, but part of that is, is I just don't load my lower, like, it's just unforgiving to train my lower body as hard. You know, these days I have the surgically removed hamstring in my left leg from an ACL surgery that just, mm. it's just a constant battle to keep all of that stuff nice. So, so I, like, I don't barbell squat anymore, like I, 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 I pendulum or whatnot. Like if I barbell squat, I do, but it's at four RIR because I know that's an exercise where if I do push it, the probability of then my back going out or something, because I just don't have the pelvic stability is there. So I just like the risk to reward for me. So occasionally I will throw it in there just because I feel like, fuck, I haven't barbell squatted in like a year. Let's just, let's just do a mezzo of, of some in here, but it'll always be like, okay, I'm going to leave reps in the tank there. And then I'm going to, I'm going to put the effort in somewhere else. So my lower body is definitely smaller than it has been prior, but then my upper body is bigger. So I am at my like largest amount of muscle mass hmm. in my career right now, just I'm a little more Johnny Bravo ish than I was when I was playing sports where yeah, I was yeah. a little bit more lower body dominant. Right. I've just kind of moved things around. So, so going back to the, uh, the new exercise stimulus, and this is something where I'm definitely not saying that I am a hundred percent confident in this only in that it will obviously, I mean, I don't think anybody should be hundred percent confident in almost anything, but, but I, I, I'm open to uh, new research on it and, and just new ideas I personally, and, and not only my experience, but that of clients, there is such a strong response when I can get somebody to focus on some key lifts and progress over time that I think a lot of my bias comes from trying to get people not to focus on the new flashiest exercise and the new flashiest routine to be consistent and to push over time. Um, obviously, with somebody, your experience and, and your situation, it would be different. I think I still have a hard time thinking. So let me just give it an example, maybe towards the extreme. If somebody was still looking to gain and they went to a gym and every single week they did new exercises, but they were good exercises, right? They were N1 approved exercises. They were done with sufficient volume and sufficient intensity, but a new exercise every week. Would you think that that person 
could gain muscle as quickly as somebody who was more consistent, maybe doing exercises for three or four months at a time. I th- I think saying you're changing the exercises every week is a little bit too much of an extreme. Now, what what I would say, like take, Why, somebody, take somebody like myself, potentially – I'm it might not make a difference because I have trained so much that I tend to be able to rotate exercises yeah. and not necessarily lose a lot of performance but I also have 25 years of training using high variety and training but for I think there still is like there tends to be around a 3 week threshold both for the repeated bout effect but also from a skill component in an exercise. And that's not like getting super neurologically efficient. That's like simply just learning the movement pattern. So I think we have to be, we have to be decent enough at the movement pattern, but we don't have to train it in, you know, for months and months and months and months on end dialing in those last percentage points. I mean, you know that, okay, the, the biggest improvement that you get when you start a new lift is right at the beginning And that's simply your body just actually getting the motor pattern down. And so when I say, yeah, you should maybe have more variety in your training, I'm not saying change every week. What I'm saying is, is like, hey, you don't have to do squats for eight months, nine months, 10 months out of the year, right? You might be able to be like, oh, okay, you know, I can squat for one or two mesos a year and that's fine. And the other thing is, is that when we're looking at changing exercises, how like you don't have to massively change things like to the point where you're going to completely lose a motor pattern like if if i'm doing similar motions but they're they're different enough that maybe i'm targeting slightly different divisions or i have maybe something that's a little bit more unilateral something has a little bit more degrees of freedom etc like the difference between doing a pull down versus a cable versus a fixed bar and different grip orientations like it's not like if you do one of those variations that you lose all proficiency in the other movement because there's still a decent amount of of carryover. So it's not like you it's not the same as like completely abandoning it and be like, OK, I'm only doing rows now and I'm not doing any vertical pulls. Right. And so I would look at it's like, OK, yeah, maybe you rotate exercises every four, six, eight weeks, not every week. And and not to shut you out here, Jeff, I just want to get the specifics down. Um, so what you're saying, just to be clear, that somewhere along those lines at the three week mark, roughly, you are becoming adapted enough to this new exercise that now, from a physiological standpoint, almost more emphasis can be put on growth that would not be happening in those first couple of weeks because it's so new. Yeah. So one, like when we're not very good at a movement, okay, it limits our motor recruitment substantially to the perceived effort of the movement is actually higher. So basically where like what you would consider a nine RPE is different when you're not good at a movement versus when you have the movement pattern dialed in. Right. And then there's also just, well, if technique does matter, that takes you around like three weeks to have the skill where you actually are controlling it and doing it as you would. Now, obviously that's going to vary because, you know, if it's an arm curl machine day one, your technique should probably be just fine. Right. But if it's a single arm overhead press, then yeah, but it, sh- it shouldn't take you six months to get good at an exercise. Like the majority of your technical improvement should happen within three weeks. And then there's that also overlaps with the repeated bout effect. So that means that basically our, like, When you look at when people are pushed with a novel stimulus, sometimes, especially if it's like a volume or whatever, there may be a period where like that, that, that protein synthesis, like how positive or negative is like when something is first put in is it maybe there's, it's a little bit more negative right now. That's more so when we go from not training to training, or we would do a substantial bump in volume. And then we quickly adapt to then switching that over to the positive, but if you were like changing mesos and stuff like that and whatever, and there was an aspect of that, you would expect that washout period to also be done within that three week window. So let me just give one example here. Cause you know, we, we recognize that if you were to step away from an exercise for some period of time, obviously you will lose a little efficiency and you'll, you'll come back weaker initially. Right. So just for ease of numbers, let's say you Kasim, were 
let's rewind a couple of years, you have a little bit less muscle mass. So there's still some more potential for growth. You do 300 pound bench press, three sets of 10. You did that. You got up to that after four months of being consistent, take some time off. You come back to it six months later. Now, because it's been a while, you're going to do three sets of 10 at 270. Do you think that on your way back up from three sets of 10 at 270 to three sets of 10 at 300 that you'd eventually get to, is there any muscle growth occurring during that period? Or is there going to be no new muscle growth until you have surpassed the previous three by 10 at 300? Um, first I'll say is I can't say, I can't say for certain, but it seems to be that we don't necessarily have to have the abs. It's not if you do one less rep than you would have done that now your stimulus goes to zero. And we don't, ex like, it's very hard to say, okay, if I'm not, if I'm doing 30 pounds less in volume per rep or whatever, so whatever that is, let's say it's it was 10 reps or whatever, so it's 300 pounds less volume load, et cetera, that that goes from like over the threshold to gains to no gains. For sure, we can be like, okay, that's less over mechanical work, but are there still some fibers that are actually getting a mechanical tension stimulus to grow. Yes. And the question to add on to that is just because the first day or week back, I have that performance drop, it's only going to take me like if my, if I ended at a peak of 300, if I've been doing similar movement patterns, it's only going to be a couple weeks before I'm, I'm itching back at that level, unless we're talking about doing things like triples and singles, right? If we're talking about stuff in a hypertrophy rep range, you're going to be able to get back to very close to that performance within a couple of weeks if you've been doing similar movement patterns, right? If I stop dumbbell pressing for a mezzo and I come back, it only takes me like two to three weeks to be almost right back on track. And then usually what then happens is I end this mezzo a little beyond where I ended the previous mezzo with that lift, right? You That's know? the hope. Sure. So I'm kind of like stair stepping that approach over time, right? And e even now, that's what's happening, right? Now, when you get to super complex and skill driven movements, that's where you're going to see the biggest change. But if that's your exercise selection for hypertrophy, you're probably picking unnecessarily challenging exercises for hypertrophy. Yeah. Um, so Jeff, yeah, I, I want to hear your thoughts because my my general conclusion yeah. there is just that I think I think in this particular example, you're right, you would get back to that performance relatively quickly. I believe that until you are surpassing again, assuming form is constant, other things are constant. I think until you are surpassing that previous performance, it, you're probably not really gaining much of anything. Otherwise, you could just infinitely cycle and, and never really get stronger. But I know we've been going for a while. So Jeff, let me hear your thoughts. Yeah. So yeah, I would say that the lower the reps, the more skill-based it is. And then some exercises are just inherently more neurological. You know, if you're doing a clean and jerk, you got to do that super frequently to stay in touch with it. Also, I think these exercises, as Cass said, they're often just not particularly good for hypertrophy often they're more explosive they require more precision timing etc a lot of my personal bests are old and if i took a crack at them over the course of 10 weeks or something yeah i, I would i would break my prs and i so it's just it's not a, a, a goal for me and so if you're training for reps i look at it as like you have a stable of exercises and some people prefer cycling those in quite rapidly. You know, you look at, say, Alec Leonidas, he might have five or six different pull-up variations, and he cycles through them sort of one at a time, and he stays in touch with them because they do sort of complement each other and train each other, and it also helps keep him healthy, right? Um, same thing with Alec Onkiri. He says that he has sort of this unpeaked level of strength. Same thing with Johnny Candido. He says that, okay, I have an unhyped one rep max where I don't get excited. I don't take free workout. And I've never even heard of that concept of an unhyped rep mm -hmm. max or an unhyped one rep max. 
but it makes sense because you don't necessarily want to go there. You almost don't want to, to PR and you want to hold yourself back. Or he'll say something like, at this point in the mesocycle, I am stronger than I was last mesocycle. And it's not a PR. It might be, say, 10 reps with his 15 rep max of all time, but he's better than he was at the same point. So it is like this stepping ladder where you step up to your best and then you you step back and you sort of reset. So other people, I mean, I prefer to keep an exercise in and get as much as I can out of it and then put in a new exercise. I think when you're more advanced, it's okay to have a little bit more frequent variation because I've only lifted about 10 years, but I could see that if I've lifted for 15 or 20 or more, you don't really lose everything. And so you can keep more in touch with more variations. But if I'm training a beginner, and this actually happened today, some guy said that, oh, I am program hopping once every three weeks. For him, that's a big issue because he hasn't really lifted enough to be in tune with his stable of exercises. He might not even have found his stable of exercises. Whereas you talk to most advanced lifters, hey, what's your favorite horizontal press? What's your favorite vertical press? What's your favorite vertical pull? What's your favorite hinge? They know. They might have three, four, five, six different variations that are their go-tos. And so either they cycle them in long periods of time and then move in a new one, or maybe they cycle them in in a little bit more of a patchwork quilt type of way where they're doing everything a little bit at once, or they're just doing sort of based on personal preference or what is available on that day. And so I found that I actually switch more than I used to, especially on isolations. So some people might see my training on Instagram and they say, oh, it's just doing random variations for arms. Well, I'm doing, I'm choosing from this stable of exercises that I have. And I'm trying to hit personal best at various rep ranges because I don't necessarily want to just spam one curl until I hit a PR or until I get an injury, because I do think that is more of a concern as you get stronger and as you become more advanced. So I think this is one thing where beginner training and very advanced training is pretty wildly different. And I think you still have to be hitting PRs for reps because yeah, even if you're advanced and you're like, oh, I haven't hit any PRs on curls for two years. Like, your arms probably haven't grown, right? Because otherwise you would be able to do that. But I don't think you necessarily need to be doing it as frequently and you probably won't be able to be doing it as frequently either. So yeah, I, I think that sometimes these advanced guys where gains have slowed down, maybe staying healthy is a priority and they have a little bit more variation than they used to and a little bit more consistent variation as well so just my thoughts so you completely agree with me then is what you're saying cool <laughs> well i think that mindset for less advanced trainees makes perfect sense like if i think you should establish what is like an unpeaked pull-up max because this is what actually power lifters do quite well where they think that okay if I'm not peaked at all for a one rep max bench, what could I do? And maybe it's 90%. That seems to be fairly typical. Maybe it's 92%, maybe it's 85%. But they find what they know they could do when they're not in touch with the movement. And they know that if they do things well and do things right, and they're consistent with that movement across an eight-week program, okay, they know they can build back up. And they know that because they've done that many times before. Whereas a beginner... I mean, they don't need that mentality because they should always be the strongest they've ever been. They don't have to get out of touch with things because they're progressing so fast that that sort of takes care of all of those problems. Plus, they're lifting lighter weights, so they don't really have to worry as much about injury. Plus, they're developing the skill of these basic lifts. I mean, starting strength would be a terrible advanced program. Like, it just doesn't make any sense at all. You would want more variation. You would want, um, you know, probably different rep ranges as well. But for what it, I mean, for what it's marketed as, I think there are, are many worse programs. So 
yeah, I think what a beginner needs and what an advanced athlete needs are totally different. And I heard one thing, actually, one last thing. I read this when I was a beginner and it confused the hell out of me. I think it was a Teen Nation article and it was an interview with a Russian athlete. And they're like, so uh, what, what, what kind of numbers could he hit right now? And he's like, uh, you know, 600 pounds or something. And the interviewer's like, but you've done 900. And he's like, yeah, well, I'm not peaked. And he's just not worried about it at all. He's like almost just, yeah, oh, that's where I am. But he knows that if he, there were probably drugs related to this as well, but like that's also a component is, is in some cases. But he just knew that he could build himself back up from where he was. And that was just sort of his uh, his unpeaked state, essentially. Mm-hmm. Yep. I think a, a good kind of, line to look at is are you still at the stage where you're trying to get better at the movement right and if that's the case then consistency is your friend but if you've reached the point where you're pretty much proficient in this movement where you can wake up and just go do it and you're it's like riding a bike so if if you've gotten like okay cool horizontal pressing it doesn't matter if it's a dumbbell, it's a barbell, it's a machine. Like I can just go in and interchangeably, I'm just good to go at all of those things. I think now you have the flexibility because the motor patterns are not drastically different. And when you're looking at reps, if you're comparing your one rep performance and then you go away from an exercise, it's going to drop substantially. But if you're looking at your 10 or 15 rep performance, it might not change like at all. Like in, in many instances, when you're changing exercises, you might be able to just go in and still hit your 10 rep PR on that exercise that you're not, not even doing. I'm pretty sure that if I bought Jeff, you know, 52 bicep curl machines that were all like just slightly different in one way. And just, he had to use a different one every week that he, he would still be fine because, I mean, what's the complexity of using a bicep curl machine? Like, you know, it's like, okay, he would just be able to go in and do it, you know, every time. And he would still be able to make the same results versus if he had to have one machine and train that one for 12 weeks and then another one for 12 weeks. I think that if he just put in the same intensity and effort that he's putting into his sets, into that, like the motor pattern is never going to likely be the limiter in the rep ranges that he's working with. But if his goal was to set a strict curl PR, well, then he's going to have to train the strict curl for, you know, triples, doubles, and and singles consistently over time to actually make that improvement. But is that going to be the best way to grow his biceps? I don't right. know. So, <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I mean, I think these are all really good points. I think my, my main emphasis earlier in that example, particularly with like the bench press, is I think if you took this to a ridiculous extreme, you could have this argument where somebody who's an intermediate, they're like, well, I can just keep cycling exercises with no strength gain. Then like if, if in this example, like I'm, there is some stimulus from 270 up to 300, well, then I'll do that. And then I'll switch exercises and I'll, I'll do that equivalent on another exercise and we'll come back. And like you even said yourself, Kasim, the goal is that the next time you come around to that exercise, you are slightly stronger than before. And I would just caution anybody who's so obsessed with the exercise variation and the novelty to be careful because it's almost like what is the easiest message to distribute to a large audience that's going to have, you know, a net good. And to me, there's a clear issue. If somebody says, hey, my emphasis is on gaining strength or reps, appropriate exercises, all of that. And then they, they they can clearly see if that's not happening. And then you can address, well, why is that not happening? Do I need to change programming? Do I need to eat more? All, all the other stuff. If it's just, hey, I need novel stimulus, and then I do this one, and now it's three weeks or even you know two months, and now I have this new novel stimulus, I can and have seen where people just get in this cycle of just no gains land for years and years because it's just this exercise and this exercise. And while I don't agree that it's just, hey, everybody just get to a 315 for 10 bench press and now you're set, nobody who does that ends up small, whereas a lot of people who end up, who who do just constant exercise variation do end up small. So it, it's simplifying it, but I just try to keep the big picture in mind that people still need to focus on progress over time. Yeah, I think the important thing is, is that I wasn't putting out as you have to change it. It's just, hey, you have options. So 
he took like Jeff's like, hey, it's okay to be emotionally attached to exercise. I would say you shouldn't be emotionally attached to exercise. It's okay to have preferences. But when you're emotionally attached, that's where then maybe you keep an exercise in even when it's not serving you. I think Listen, like when you're like, bar oh. is next to me in my bed when I go to sleep. <laughs> All right. right. <laughs> don't take it away. Yeah. So, yes, I don't I, – I think that both of those approaches are fine. And you can look at strength through through two different lenses. Like because if you can only express strength in a limited number of movement patterns, are you strong or are you skilled at three movement patterns? <laughs> cool, cool. Zing. Zing. Okay. Cool guys. So, all right. Well, that was most of what I want to talk about. We got some of the uh, the clickbaity stuff in there. The uh, you had the comment on V Shred, which is the uh, the ultimate the ultimate guy in our industry. That that's the level where <laughs> where you know you, you do get some of these people where I'm like, you know, I, I think at the other day, Mike Isertel is probably a, like a well intentioned guy and whatnot. When you when you get to the V Shred level, it's just like wow, like you just don't care that you're just blatantly <laughs> shilly nonsense to. But I guess millions of people. Yeah. So that that kind of stuff is always interesting. But I I like to think that his stuff is more of a meme at this point. But I guess not. I mean, he must have a successful company, just more to Gen Pop and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can't argue with the uh, the success in terms of their in terms of their growth, yeah. right? But I'm curious if their demographic is also changing with that, right? I mean they've gained like half a million followers in just the last few months on YouTube. Mm, oh, really? Are those, or do, are those half a million followers the same demographic as their first hundred thousand? Right. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I can't say I follow them, but it, it is interesting. So, okay guys. So thank you for taking the time. Thanks for the flexibility with the timing. Uh, where can we find more of your stuff? Let's start with Kasim. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, coach underscore Kasim, and I am doing my best to join you guys on the YouTubes. So you can find me on there. It's just N1 Education, and we're doing podcasts like this. See you there. Cool. And Jeff? Uh, yeah, just Jeff Riverdale Skillfield on YouTube and Instagram. Instagram was mostly just stories. But uh, hopefully they're useful. I usually post my my workouts there. People might find that uh, interesting and and barbaric. Cool, cool. All right, thanks again, guys.